you have Sunday papers on the back is a outline that we'll try to follow. Um, you might pull that out. Some of you who, um, yeah, some of you who need that things. Uh, used to watch um, television back in the day, and there was a cousin it, and people who bought certain kinds of shoes one day pumped it up and post it. Notes are popular, and um, you can stop it or you give me it and you ask people, did you see it? And you say, it was awesome, it was awful, I hate it, I can't live without it, I wish I had it, I wish she would lose it, what is it? And we're going to spend a few minutes today on a two-letter word, I-T, it. We're going to talk about it today. And hopefully what you're going to walk away with is an understanding a little more of something that's not understandable, but it is crazy powerful. It's a two-letter word. It can mean anything or everything. But when you see a person, a team, a company, an organization that has it, you know it. It is invisible, yet it's undeniable. It is mysterious, and it's magnetic. Everybody wants it, yet it refuses to be packaged so it can be obtained. A few years ago, Craig Rochelle wrote a book, and it was entitled, it. Well, you guys are on it this morning. All right, you're following along. It was entitled It. And it was written to church leaders and people who do the church thing to help us to understand a little bit more about it. In its first chapter, he writes, I can't tell you exactly what it is. Part of what it makes it, it, is that it defines categorization. It won't reduce to a, memorial, a memorable slogan. It is far more special than that. We can't create it. We can't reproduce it. We can't manufacture it. It's not a model, it's not a system, it's not the result of a program. You can't purchase or manufacture it, it can't be copied. Not everyone will get it, it can't be learned in a classroom, yet even though it can be taught, it it can't be taught, it can be caught. That is why we choose to embrace the fact that God makes it happen. It is from him, it is by him, it is for his glory. And what I would say to all that to lead us forward this morning is how important it is, and how I can tell you that everyone in the room wants it, everyone in the room craves it, God built inside of you a desire for it, but the last part is the mystery part. It's us. It's how we go about receiving it and the difference that it makes. You, you try to reproduce it, you can't. You, you go faster in life hoping that speed has something to do with it. You get louder, you think that the loudness of life will, it can't be created, it can only be received. It's what God laid upon the people who would build the church for him, the disciples in the book of Acts. It's what Abraham had in Je- Genesis chapter 22 when he took his son Isaac up and God asked him to sacrifice his son. He had it that led him by obedience to the place of even giving up his own son. It's what Peter had in uh, Matthew chapter 14 when he was told to get out of the boat and walk on the water. There was a factor inside of Peter that said, get up, go for it. It's what Moses had in Exodus 34 when he came back from an encounter with God. It said his face was shining, his skin kind of lit up is what the Bible says it, because he had it. It's what Stephen had in Acts chapter 7 as he was receiving the stones that would kill him in a cruel death. He was being stoned to death, but everyone around him saw in the last moments of his life that he had it. He had the presence of God. And I want to direct your attention just for a second to the book of Acts this morning and show you that in Acts, Peter and John had it. In Acts chapter 4, so there's an encounter And if you went through the book of Acts, well, they won't have time to do in detail this morning, you'll see that this is the book that's right after the crucifixion, right after the resurrection, right after Jesus comes and and begins to show his face, literally, to his disciples again. And he tells them, this is a process, fellas, and I need to leave so we can move forward. It's been the startup of something in the three years of Jesus' public ministry, but now he's going to leave and the carry out of the ministry will be left in the hands of these 11 and they'll elect a 12th guy. These 12 people will carry on the operation of the kingdom of God on earth. So he says to them, here's how it's going to happen. Wait for it because you will receive it. And when you receive it, then I want you to go out and distribute it. So they wait and it comes upon them. 
in the presence of the Spirit of God or in the process, in the moment of the indwelling, I don't care which word, the fullness, which word you use, God comes upon them. And right away you understand this as you look through the scripture, that right away you understand that right when God comes upon people, it's a misunderstood moment, right? The crowd around him says, uh, really, this early in the morning you started drinking? And they have to explain that when God came upon them, it looked crazy, it looked radical, but it wasn't that, it was God. It was God refusing to be contained in description. It was God moving on these people for the advancement of the kingdom. And so they go out. Peter and John go out in the third chapter of Acts and they go to the temple where they've gone many, many times and they see and probably have seen before a man at the temple gates and he's doing what you do in that day if you don't have the ability to sustain yourself. He's crippled. So he comes to that place and he begs for money. It's what you do. They look at him. He expects money from them. Hey, give me something. And they say, we don't have this. This is critical. Is we don't have silver or gold, but what we have, we will give you. It's the idea that what God has given them, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, they are to distribute to others and they give him a power of healing. Now, this is crazy good because that looks unobtainable to us it looks like a certain amount of people or a certain person they must have had this they must have had that Acts chapter 4 tells you exactly the opposite in verse 13 they're hauled in in front of a whole bunch of religious people they're asked what are you doing how are you doing this end of chapter 3 beginning of chapter 4 this is their description if you will of these people of these two guys when they saw the courage of Peter and John Acts 4 13 and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus I'm about to blow up the church system and you're going to go that's awkward but I'm going to tell you the people that God uses are not the most educated they don't spend the most time in the building they don't have the most degrees they have it they have it And man, you want to be around with somebody who's got it. And we spend a lot of time in the church trying to reproduce it. We try to get more of it by doing this. And the fact of the matter is we're doing it backwards. The reception of it is all about surrender. It's all about giving up. It's all about those people who lay down their life will find it. It's not something we can obtain. It's not something we can impress somebody with. But when you have it, it is unmistakable. So you're an educator, you run a business, you're a coach. You're all looking for the same person, aren't you? Interview process, the owner of the business opens up the interview process and sits across the desk or a table from someone, and you know what they're looking for? It. They are. You know what the deal is? There are many candidates to these job positions, and they all come into the room with credentials and this and educations and that. But the good employer is going, there's one thing, that doesn't come in that package. It's called want to. It's called it. It's the drive, it's the passion, it's the inner stuff that says, I'll overcome, I'll move forward. And when you find those people, they make businesses go. They make teams succeed. They're the standouts in the classroom because what you can't give is it. The want to part, the inner drive in a person. And everyone in this room is a product of that. And every one of you knows, yeah, that's what I want to be. Yet there is a big fight going on to keep you from being a person that possesses it. Because the it's of the world, the people that have it, they drive the kingdom forward. So there's a big moment in that. It's a rare combination of qualities. That's what it says in your uh, little outline thing. It's a passion for God's presence, a deep craving to reach the lost. There's integrity. There's spirit-filled faith. There's down-to-earth humility. There's brokenness. But you still can't get enough words around this thing. Someone has it. You got it. And you got it to give away. And the more of it you give away, the more you know the power of it. And the more God supplies it, the more you withdraw The more you go back into safety and security and surroundings, you lose the edge of it. You lose the moment of it. It's not a model system. It's not a result of programs. You can't purchase it. It can't be copied. Not everyone will get it. It can be learned even though it's really tough. The factors of the good news, if you don't have it, you can get it. 
The bad news is you have it, you can lose it. Beautiful buildings, cool environments, and the right technology are not necessary to have it. In fact, it's almost exactly the opposite. A person surrendered fully to Christ gets it, and once a person has it, he can't keep it to himself. And that's the awesome opportunity we have this morning, is to understand we can't keep it for ourselves. I recognize a message like this is a bit challenging because fuzzy as it sounds, it I have to help you understand that this is what, in my experience anyway, this is what people are looking for today. What, what decides, makes decisions for people is not the things that we think. Again, size of building, ability to do this, speak this way, sing this way. It's actually God's presence. It's it. And God, when he empowers someone, has done and is doing an impossible and an unstoppable thing. If you've never had it, ask for it. That's the end of the first part, Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you don't have it, the presence of God, you may have never entered into a relationship with God. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Romans 10, 9, and 10. I think the majority of people in the room, safely to say, would say, okay, I've had it. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a walking with God person. I've received him, but maybe we're in these places of maybe a coolness toward it, or we've lost it. So the middle part of the bulletin outline on the back says, if you've had it, first of all, admit you lost it. If you had it one time, if you had a zeal for God, a passion for your neighborhood, a real fired up moment about this whole Christian thing, maybe the moment is just a return. That's where Andrew was talking about today. He was talking about the prodigal coming home. It's the admitted the prodigal got to a place in his life where he had to admit, hey, eating pig food's just not working for me. Literally. But you know how hard that is for most of us self-sufficient, self-sustaining people to actually get to the place where we say, I'm not, I'm not really where I should be? Very hard. Very hard. We're still trying to find our own way, do our own stuff. The people that possess it are the people that admit Hey, I don't have it anymore. And second, what they do is in that process, they actually go back to wanting it or the, the desire raises up in them of the, the unsatisfied nature. I, I just don't want to live like this anymore. That mediocrity becomes like a bad taste in their mouth. That apathy becomes that thing that they can't stand anymore, which are primary weapons of the other side. You see, the other side's really concern is not to take you, if you will, and trash your whole relationship with God. It's just to make you apathetic and uncaring about the whole thing. Hey, I got God. I'm good. Hey, I'm in the right place. That's the worst, not the worst, that's the primary enemy's weapon is to convince us, hey, you're okay. Or increase your pace, you'll find it. How's that working for you? the more the chase goes on. You're getting closer to God? We all know the answer, right? Some of you have let your occupation steal it. If the truth were known, you give the first fruits of your life and your giftedness to that thing that pays you. And you say to God, thank you, and there's nothing left for him. Your passion for the things of God has grown weak because the world has your primary giftedness. The things God gave you are engaged in producing for you, which is fine, right? You have a nice home to live in and you get a good salary. But what really hurts your heart is you know that all that stuff isn't what God created you for. And you have to get back to the place where you admit it and you want it. And you do the things, the third part, you do the things that you were practicing when you knew that God's presence was all over you. Those practices, you just return to those. Was it solitude time? Was it reading time? I don't know what your practices were, but we know when we were in the sweet spot with God, we know what we were doing and how that ministered to us and it fed us and it pushed us along. Now, again, when I have this right in the middle of this message, I can tell that I'm speaking to a lot of people who just don't care to have it. It's all right. I can't push anybody in this congregation today to want God any more than you do. Frankly, I'll be honest with you, you all have as much of God as you want. I have as much of God as I want. My daily schedule, the ways I spend my money, the ways I invest my time are a reflection of how much God I want. 
you know, like, okay, everyone quit your job and say that, okay? Those are very necessary things to your life, but who are you working for? The paycheck or the guy who gave you the giftedness to do your job? You see, because through your giftedness to do your job, it's possible that that's how God's expanding the kingdom. I met a man last week in the lobby who said, yeah, the guy I was working with invited me to come to church today. That sounds to me like somebody whose job doesn't own them, but knows who gave them the job and the abilities for the job to advance the kingdom. That's kind of a cool moment that God would work in your place of worship, work in your place of work, in your school system, to advance his kingdom through the gifts that he's given you. But you have to want to do that. I think most of us just want to keep what we have. We've experienced the passion of God, and we know that it goes up and down, and sometimes we're hot, and sometimes we're a little more cooled off, but we've lost this idea that we have to keep manufacturing that that we have to keep working for that and stretching that. Again, if an employer hires an employee today and sees that skill set the employee has, he doesn't say to the employee, just do that for the next X number of years. Each employer expects that person will grow because their area of work will grow. It'll change. The techniques will be different. So they'll have to be a growing person. Each coach looks at his teammates, the team that he chooses, and he says, okay, guys, this is where you are now. I expect you to be in a different place down the road. And these are some of the things that people who have it are frequently engaged in. One, they're engaged in places, things, and people that stretch them. That stretch them. This is something that's crazy today, but I will tell you that you can tell who has it and who doesn't have it by their willingness to be stretched. People that do not have it resist stretching. And you know what they do? They raise all kinds of ruckus to other people who are stretching and being stretched. They want to live inside of boundaries. And if it's not inside of the boundaries, then it must be wrong. Instead of letting God stretch them to the place where they begin to question the things in a right kind of fashion. And now I'm not talking about those central truths, but some of this stuff that we're keeping boundaries on is not really that important to God. Some of the methods that we use to reach people are not really sacred. They're the things that we experience that work for us, but down the road, God will change that, and we're being stretched into more of those places. We're being those people. I understand it today. It's very difficult to be stretched because stretching involves the engagement that you and I would have in moving forward. People who want to move forward are always being stretched. Every time you head into a classroom as a student, guess what they're doing to you? Boring you. I understand that part, okay? Boring you. Uh, Aside from that stuff, a good teacher is doing what? Stretching the students. Every time you enter into the, you know, boundaries of a court or a field, a good coach is doing what to the players? Pushing them. Stretching them. But then ask coaches, right? Ask Coach Lott. Not every one of his players wanted to be stretched. And guess who the players were that began to excel? The people who were willing to be stretched. And his team's performance was directly linked to the number of kids, number of athletes he had who wanted to be stretched. Give him 10 I want to be stretched kids on his team, he goes farther than 10 gifted kids who came to practice and said, I already got it figured out, coach. I don't need you. That's life today. The people who are experiencing God's presence are the people who show up every day in their Christian life going, stretch me, God. Take me new places. Challenge my boundaries. Get me into true investigation of stuff. Because what we're doing is when we don't want to be stretched is we stay within these boundaries and we essentially limit God. And I'm telling you, God is not good with being limited. He is unlimited, undescribable, no boundary kind of God, and we're trying to get him into what we can figure out. Good people who are being stretched, pushing the envelope, are those people who say, I'm good today, God, with something new. I want to be challenged. I want to push forward. That's why I'm investing myself in meeting with one or two people every week. That's why I have a small group in my life. That's why I study the word of God every day because it's a stretching process. It's a stretching process. And those people who are not being stretched are resisting and I can tell you they resist and they complain and they post or they do it's because stretching is tough it's tough 
You have to get in it to be stretched. You know, people come to practice on the sports team or go to classrooms. They don't show up that way every day. Sometimes they're tired and bored, and the coach is the enemy. But what the coach is relentless on is, I will stretch you, I will stretch you, I will stretch you. Second, what people who have it are always striving to be, is, or, or always allowing themselves to be, if you will, is to be ruined. Ruined. Good things happen when you are ruined in the right way. Ruining is the process that God takes us through to show us our passions. And you already know that, some of you. Some of you cannot stand and you're going to fill in the blank. That thing that ruins you is very likely the very thing God is calling you to engage in. So you are a person who's never gone out of the country, and uh, one day there's a missions trip offered through your church, and you go there, and guess what happens on your missions trip? You get ruined. Your heart breaks because you enter into a world that you've never seen before, and Almighty God says, I wanted to stretch you, and in fact, I'm going to take you beyond stretching to ruining you. Now, God would not ruin you, does not have the practice of ruining me, to say, ha ha, I ruined you. Hurts, doesn't it? No, what God says on the backside is, of the ruining is, I've equipped you to do something about what ruins you. So there are two things that ruin me right off the top. One is the relationship between a father and a son. It's my field of dreams moment at the end to play catch, dad and son. I can't do that moment without crying. My definition of crying, one tear. Her definition of he was bawling. I do not bawl, okay? I am a man. I do not bawl. I cry every once in a while. Bawling is not a trickle, okay? This is the thing we have going on. She always tells her daughter, gee, your dad was bawling. I do not bawl. I cry. But why does that ruin me? Because I believe so strongly in the relationship and the mentoring possibilities and the power of father to son, a God-created thing, that I will enter relationships with people to try to restore that for them, to build the value of that, and when I find someone who's fatherless, I'll even try to be that figure for them because I think that that is so crucial to life. But it breaks my heart every time I see that scene in that movie. It ruins me. On the backside, it ruins me to be in action. The second thing that ruins me is any story about someone's conversion. Any story anywhere about somebody finding Jesus and saying yes to him. I can't read a book that has it in it without a tear. Again, not bawling, without a tear. I can't look at some of you in the congregation without a lump in my throat because I was there when that happened, when you gave your life to Jesus. Now listen, being ruined in God's sense is that thing he's called you to do. Your pain, the thing you've been ruined over, is very likely where God's calling you to engage. Huh? There would not be a mother's against drunk driving without a mom who heart, whose heart got ruined when she lost her child to a drunk driver. There are countless lives that have been saved today because one mother's ruining moment was the moment God had called her to. How about you? What is it that you can hardly embrace, that you have to turn your back on because it hurts your heart so much? Is it possible that God is calling you to engage that moment? I think there's an unlimited number of possibilities for things, to be, things and people to minister to within the church. It's only limited by the people who take their ruining and internalizing, internalize it and won't let anybody else in on the picture. There are a lot of you today who have, if in your life experience, the ruining, breaking heart, tough moment of life, and you've never let anybody in on it, and it's limiting what God can do. You see, ruined people minister to ruined people. Broken-hearted people minister to broken-hearted people. The shattered life that you may feel you're in right now, you're looking, this is the pieces of my life, might very well be what God is calling you into. That marriage that didn't work out for you may very well be your ministry. That God could be calling you into other people's lives just like you. The unfairness of the loss of a job. God could be calling you into that moment because someone right in this congregation with you today knows that moment and they think they're alone. And no one's ever had the courage to open up and say, me too. You see, when we take ruining from God's perspective, it is a tool in his hands. 
He takes our ruining, our humpty dumpty sat on the wall, busted up experience, and he says, Dab, I have a power in that moment that you can exhibit, that you can exert to other people. The third part is that there is a part of both all of us in our process, just like that, follows the ruining, where you are looking to God for healing. God, stretch me, take me places I haven't been. God, break my heart and ruin me. And some of you have gone through both of those processes and you need some healing. And to this moment, you've tried everything, if you will, but God, you've worked harder. You've suppressed and pushed something down. But listen, hurt people hurt people. And if you haven't brought your heart to God for his healing, you're limited in what you can do for him. Now, when I talk about healing, it's this awkward moment. I made this mistake many years ago in my ministry. Many years ago in my ministry, I was giving a message, and I actually said something, the words to this effect, and when you lose someone and you're grieving, don't worry, you'll get over it, and then you'll be able to help someone else. And you think I didn't get a little bit talking to you about that? Oh, yeah. First at home, because <laughs> Kathy had recently lost her mom, and then from several other people who brought, but you know what I messed up on? I had messed up on the difference between having a healed heart and hurting. You see, healing doesn't take away hurting. Healing is the opportunity to go to Almighty God who alone has that moment, that healing moment in store for your soul, but the hurting is still there. And the heartache is still there because those are products of loving And those things, as you bear them, become instruments when you have a healed heart of reaching someone else through your pain, through your heartache, but you've taken the healing. Because healing, without the process of healing, bitterness begins. Anger creeps in. And you will be forever trying to press that down. And it limits what you can do. So some of you I'm encouraging today, the reason you don't have it anymore and the power in your life is is because you haven't sought God's healing. I'm not talking about someone else. I'm talking about Almighty God. I encourage some of you to, to, to be involved with people because that heartache and that hurt, you need people, in your, but they can't heal you. Only God can heal you. He knows your heart. It's part of what we just went through at Easter. By his stripes, you were, you were healed. By the stuff that he endured, by what he took on for you was to say to that moment, I know that moment, I want to bring healing to you. But if he removed all the heartache and all the hurt, it would not have a power. Because there's a power in heartache. There's a power in hurt. And God wants to harness that for you. And he wants to reach other people because, you know what he said churches should look like? Messed up groups of people hurting more like hospitals than some sort of country clubs. Because God, almighty God, knows that today there's all kinds and all measures and all numbers of hurts within the building. And that's a good sign because we can walk with each other in our heartache and in our hurt, but we can't heal like God can heal. Bring your stuff to him. People who have it are crazy fun to be around. Organizations that have it attract people from everywhere. We are not special as a group of people in a way of saying that because around the world today, there are literally millions of groups of people who are meeting to worship God. But when we have it, God can do things that only God can do. It is so attractive. It separates people. It separates organizations. It separates churches. It makes us way bigger than we could ever think of being on our own. Having it very difficult, very difficult. Living in the middle of it, fighting back the, the processes of just becoming normal or apathetic or I have enough or coasting or drifting or whatever. It's always, and it will be a constant struggle. But it, passion for God and the things of God will always trump your performances. They will always trump your performances. You're worried about the wrong things. We're worried about the wrong things sometimes. We do this well enough. If we get that done right, oh, I want us to strive for excellence. But listen, at the end of the day, it's do we have it or not? Do you have it or not? 
Are you striving to bring your life to the place where it's, I lay down my life to gain my life? I'm giving up the stuff, God, that's mine, and I just wholly want to take on you? There's a power in that. There's an attraction in that. All around the world today, God is using people who have it to do extraordinary things beyond their stuff, beyond what they can ask, beyond what they can imagine, Ephesians 3.20 says. Those people are doing things for God's kingdom because they have it. They don't look like it on the outside, but they have it. They're the people that God is using. I want to be part of a church, a group of people. And the people say, "Uh, what's going on over there? And I want to say, you can't describe it. You can't package it. But it is happening because it changes people's lives. Stand and pray. God, this morning I thank you that I, I can tell. Now you look out in this crowd when I'm talking right now, I can tell there are some really hungry people to have it. You know, we do. We have as much of you as we want. And there are some people today who want so much more, who are not satisfied with the walk with God that they have, who are not ready to say they've arrived or achieved something, who are really wanting to be stretched and ruined for your sake. I ask you to be in the process with us. Stretch us, Lord. Take us in the places where we never would have seen ourselves going. Ruin us for the things of God. Heal our hearts from the stuff of the world that happens. It's unfair. It doesn't make sense. Bring a healing to people in that way this morning. But let us be described as people who have it. It's just confusing sometimes. We won't even know how to do it, but we'll know, wow, God, you're in the midst of us because you are working. People have it. They're excited about you. Raise up a group of people who have it to go into a world as salt and light. Thank you for your word this morning for our opportunity to go farther, to push beyond where we are with you. That's what our souls are are really crying out for today is help me to be more, God. Drive us forward, push us, Lord. We want to have that undescribable, indescribable thing of God. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.